Hey guys, welcome to another video. So today we continue on with the inverse trig um, topic in the extension one syllabus. We already did a video uh, last time, which basically delve into sketching inverse trig. This lesson will focus on finding exact values with inverse trig. So before I go on, if you haven't seen the last video, please go see that one. Also, if you haven't already, uh, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and then tell your friends. Thank you. Let's get started. So a little bit of theory before we dive into this topic. So please remember that um, for inverse trig, right? Just want to recap before I start that. For domain range rest, if I had the function um, inverse sine, right? We know that the domain, right, is between one and negative one and the range is between negative pi and two and pi and two, right? Yeah, we know that. Now, with that in mind, so that's for inverse sine and we all know that the graph sort of looks a little bit like, so I'm just gonna be speedy about this. So something like that, right? Where that's negative pi and two that is one, that is negative one and top here at pi and two. Yeah, we know this, we did this in the last video, but just to recap, right? Just to start from that, um, start from that base, right? So inverse cos, same deal, right? Domain X is between one negative one and the range is between zero and pi, right? And just for, oh, sorry, let me draw a quick sketch. Move this down slightly. Um, draw a quick sketch of the inverse cos, which is all positive in the way that we've restricted the domain. That's one, that's negative one, zero is here and pi is up here. And lastly, for completeness, um, you got y equals to 10 inverse, right? Which looks has all real x for its domain and then for the range, there's no equal sign because they're asymptotes, but so the graph a little bit like this. I'm sorry, let me get that better. Centered. So asymptote there, asymptote there, and then sort of like a yeah, trick up on that. That's pi on two. Negative pi on two there, all right? That was all from the last lesson. Now, what I wanna show you this lesson. Now, there's two types of exact value questions, right? When it comes to inverse trig, I'll deal with the first type, right? So yeah, first type. So Roman numeral part I, yeah. We're just gonna call it type one, all right? Type one is when the inverse um, function is on the outside and the trig functions on the inside. So if I asked you, right, as let, let's demonstrate, right? So if I asked you to find the exact value, right? And I'll give you like question A. And I said, um, sine inverse of sine uh, pi on three, right? Now, when you do that, conceptually, we know that sine and sine inverse are mutually inverse. And what normally happens when you um, apply a composite function where the inverse is there and the original function is there, they sort of neutralize each other, right? And you generally get um, the value back. So the answer for here should be pi and three, but I mean, if you were to work through it, right? You basically go sine inverse there of, now sine pi on three, that's like sine 60, which is root three on two, right? Root three on two. And when you inverse that, you get your pi on three three back. Now, a lot of people think, wait a second, when you inverse that, don't you have like multiple answers in trigonometry? Absolutely true, but please remember, and the whole reason why I did those graphs are there, sine inverse is um, bound by, sorry, the y values, right? The range is bound by pi on two and negative pi on two. And within that bound, there's only one quadrant that has positive values and one quadrant that's negative, right? So the first quadrant is where the positive is. So that it doesn't go up to pi, right? So second quadrant is excluded. So whenever you have sine inverse of a positive, it's only in the first quadrant. Does that make sense? So you only get one answer 
um, when we do sine inverse of um, sine pi on three, right? And now I really wanted to explore a quick question where what if I had something that looks like this? And it's such a common, in fact, the, the first past paper question that I have for you next um, has the same same type of concept, but I'd like to sort of explore one with you before we do that, right? Very common question. And you basically attack it the same way, right? You attack the same way where you say to yourself, well, cause, I mean, that's in the second quadrant, right? That's 120 degrees. Um, that's like cause 120, right? Which we know is going to be negative cause 60. That's like what, negative half, yeah? And so if we do it, we go sine inverse of negative half. Now, because of this range, right? The negative angle should be um, in the third and the fourth quadrants, right? But for sine, now I know that that's going to be, um, if I use my normal sort of angles of any magnitude or station central approach, right? You ignore the negative at sine inverse of a half, which is 30 degrees, take it to the third and the fourth, and then minus 360. But guys, long story short, if you got like the answer, that would be like negative pi on six, right? Yeah. So I guess what I'm trying to say is in sign when you're doing inverse trig, right? And the inverse is on the outside, abide by the range that's given by the inverse function of sine inverse, right? So then there's only one answer, right? There's only one answer. Um, because it's a one to one function, right? Remember all inverse trig graphs are one to one. Um, there's only one answer for, for every um x value, there's only one y value, right? Is that cool, guys? So this concept here, just got to find the exact value and then uh, apply some trigonometry and then make sure your answer is within the range. Let's do a past paper question on it, right? So I've got um, one prepared from Ascom, right? So same deal, sorry, that's a three there, right? So once again, we basically find the exact value of this guy, which now, what's that? Um, that's in the third quadrant, right? And that's equal to so negative sine third quadrant, so pi plus that, so minus pi from that, you get pi on three. So that's equivalent to negative sine 60, so negative root three on two, right? So this question becomes cos inverse of negative root three on two. Now for a cos graph, right? We know that because it's between zero and pi, it's in the first two quadrants. Right? So when it's negative, it's in the second quadrant. Does that make sense, right? So if it's, in, if it's negative, it's in the second quadrant. So I know this is going to be, um, now, off to the side, right? I know that cos inverse of root three on two positive. What's that? Uh, 30 degrees, so pi on six. So in the second quadrant, this will be 180 minus theta, which is going to be five pi on six, right? So just to recap, how do I know it's in the second quadrant? Because in this graph here, that's the second quadrant. And this is the first quadrant, right? Zero to pi on two, pi on two to pi. That's definitely in the second quadrant. It doesn't allow, cause it can be negative in the third quadrant as well. But because my range is between zero and pi, third quadrant's excluded, right? Only in the second quadrant. So um, 180 minus theta, so uh, five pi on six. Is that okay? So the first type, type one, has the inverse functions, right? Inverse functions outside, right? Always inverse functions outside. Now, they're not the fun ones. The fun ones are type two where the inverse is on the inside, right? They're the ones that are more common and uh, more marks, right? So let's go there. So before I go there, maybe I'll do a, one quick question. So um, with you, and then I'll do two past paper questions, right? So part two, type two. The type two example, find the exact value of, and let's just make up one, right? Sign, oh, we keep doing sign inverses. Maybe I'll do cos inverse of um, 10, um, let's go two on seven, right? Now, so when you see this, um, to attack this question, right? Oh, sorry, I said I wouldn't do that uh, and I did. So type two is when the tan inverse, so when the inverse is inside the function, right? 
So when you do this, whenever you see the inverse function inside, right? I always say to my students, you basically replace, right? Replace this guy's alert, alpha, or some other variable, maybe x, um, it's one seven, yeah, or, or, or theta. Um, because what you're gonna do now, what the moment you let the inside be alpha, the question becomes, can you please find me the value of cos alpha, right? How do I find cos alpha? Well, in your let, if you sort of move the tan back to this side, right? Yeah, you now have tan alpha equals two and seven. That gives you information to draw yourself a right angled triangle and apply Sokotoa where um, tan is opposite over adjacent. And then you use Pythagoras to find the other side. What's that root 49 plus four, was that 53? And from this triangle, right? I'm after cos alpha, remember? I can find cos alpha. So therefore, cos alpha is adjacent on hypotenuse. And that's my answer. Right, that's my answer to um, well, to exact values, right? So just to recap, whenever you have inverse function inside the function, let that be alpha or theta, whatever you want. That gives you information to draw a right angle triangle. And from that right angle triangle, go back to the original replacement. I need to find cos alpha. Cos alpha is adjacent on hypotenuse. That's your answer. Is that okay? Guys, these questions are very classic and the way they make it harder is by applying um, double angles and compound angles. Let's, look, let's have a look at the next one, right? So normally there are like two, three marks in a test. So this was from Norman Hurst. Guys, I've seen this type of question. So this is the most common one. This is the most common one. You must be able to do this, right? So once again, signs on the outside, we have a situation where the inverse is there. There's a two there, right? There is a two there. So, but the way you, you attack this question is, Whatever the inverse is, I'll let that be alpha, right? So ignore the two for now in front, the blue highlighted part there. Because the moment you let this guy be alpha, right, your question becomes sine two alpha, right? And using our double angles, we know that that's two sine alpha, cos alpha. Now, why is that important? Because from this expression, I need to find expression of sine alpha and cos alpha, right? That's what uh, your question has become. So move the cos over and you got cos alpha equals a root three on four. Hey, I already, I need sine alpha and cos alpha. I already found cos alpha. So from the resultant right angle triangle, right? From the right angle triangle that I'm going to develop from this, um, I need to find sine alpha, right? That's the only one that's missing right now. So I basically go, draw yourself a right angle triangle, right? This is alpha um, adjacent on hypotenuse. So by Pythagoras, what? This is square root of 16 minus three, so 13. Yeah. So therefore, sine alpha. Now I only need sine now. I already got cos alpha, right? So sine alpha would be opposite over hypotenuse, right? So got this guy, got this guy, plug them both into the question. So therefore, right? Therefore, two sine alpha cos alpha, right? Which is what I want as part of this question will be two times. Sine would be root 13 on four and cos would be root three on four. Um, what's that going? So the twos will cancel out bottom 16. So root 39 on eight. Is that right? Yeah, maybe check that. Um, make sure my math is right. I think that's right, guys. Is that okay? So that's how you would attack it when there's a two in front, right? When there's a two in front, double angles, right? Two theta, two alpha in this case, um, and then expand that. So you can find, so, so you know to find sine alpha and cos alpha and through the right angle triangle. In this case, cos is already given. We just need to find sine. Is that all right, guys? I've got one more question. Once again, how, do, how does this look differently? Instead of double angles, they'll use compound angles, right? So look at the next one. Once again, a very classic question. This one's from Hunter's Hill, I believe. Yep, Hunter's Hill, classic question where there's um, sine and then there's cos, out, uh, cos inverse and, si uh, and tan inverse, right? So what we're gonna do is basically have two replacements, right? Two substitutions. So for this guy, we go let alpha equals to cos inverse of four and five. And then from this guy, 
we basically go let beta maybe equal to tan inverse of five on 12. Yeah, and so then my question becomes sine alpha minus beta, right? Sorry, I'll, I'll do it down here. Yeah, so I'll do it down here. So then my question becomes sine alpha minus beta, and which we know if I expand that using compound angles, right? Sine alpha cos beta minus um, sine beta cos alpha, right? Yeah, that's what I'm after. So I'm after sine alpha, uh, four things, right? I'm after one, two, three, four things. All right, let's start with the pink, right? So move the cos over, cos alpha equals a four and five. Guys, that's one of the four that I need, cos alpha. I need sine alpha, so let's develop a right angle triangle from this. That's alpha adjacent hypotenuse by Pythagoras. I mean, they're nice triangular Pythagorean tri tri triads, right? And then from here, I've got cos alpha. I need sine alpha, so sine alpha equals two, opposite on hypotenuse. Now, this guy and this guy are needed, needed in the four things that I need. The other two would come from here, so move the tan over. Once again, that's information for me to draw a right angle triangle, beta. Now this is tan, so opposite adjacent by Pythagoras. That's once again, a nice Pythagorean triad, that's 13. Now I need sine and cos, I've got tan, so I need to find sine beta equals to opposite over hypotenuse and cos would be adjacent on hypotenuse. Guys, I have the four ingredients for my question. So let's just sub it in. Sine alpha is three on five. Cos beta is 12 on 13. Sine beta is five on 13. And cos alpha is four on five. And <coughs> pardon me, um, punch in capital was at 36 minus 2016 over uh, uh, 365. You guys check the math there. I think that's right, um, guys. And that's how you do it. So exact values with inverse functions, that's how I would attack it. So there are two types, just to recap. Right, the first type is when you have the inverse outside and the trig um, expression inside. And when that happens, you basically just find the exact value, figure out based on the inverse function, what your range is, because if it's positive or negative, so mainly when it's negative, right? Positive is always in the first quadrant. When it's negative, when the expression inside is negative, you just got to find the quadrant. So when it's sine inverse here, we found that it was in the, um, for, for it to be negative, based on the range, it's in the uh, fourth quadrant. So it has to be negative, right? Negative, whatever angle it is. But in the past paper question here, because we're doing cos inverse, sine four pi on three is negative and negative for cos inverse is in the second quadrant. So then we had to do 180 minus theta, right? And then the next type, whenever you have inverse function inside the function and trig on the outside, use substitution, replace it with alpha, get a right angle or triangle happening and then solve the question. Guys, hopefully that was okay. If you like that, please like the video, subscribe to the channel and tell your friends. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys at the next one.